Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hello and welcome to the ISO Show. Well, if businesses aren't talking about COVID right now, they're talking about how to become carbon neutral. To show their commitment to protecting the environment, companies are often claiming to be carbon neutral. But the issue there is, where is the actual proof? Where is the credible framework that demonstrates their carbon verification? So today, I'm excited to share with you some information on how to get started with providing an introduction to ISO 14064, the Carbon Footprint Verification Standard. So if you're looking for a sustainability roadmap for your business and wondering where to begin, we're going to be providing you with information on that over the next couple of podcasts. Because there are so many opportunities that come with having a strong sustainability strategy in place, not only to address the climate emergency, but also to meet your stakeholders' needs, both now and in the future. Because the time is really now to act. We can't really afford to wait for another five, ten years. You know, governments across the globe have got specific deadlines, whether it's 2030 or 2050, depending on which country you're in. So there isn't much point in waiting for that because we're not actually going to meet our targets unless we do actually act now. So over the next three podcasts, I'm delighted to be joined by David Algar, who's our resident carbonologist here at Blackmores, who's going to share with you information about the international standards that everyone is talking about when it comes to demonstrating your carbon neutrality, which includes ISO 14064 for carbon footprint verification and PAS 2060 on carbon neutrality. So in this episode, we're going to be talking just about ISO 14064. In the second podcast, we'll be talking about PAS 2060 on carbon neutrality. And in the third and final podcast of this series, we'll be sharing with you how to implement both standards using our proven methodology, which is called Carbonology. So without further ado, welcome David. Hi Mel, thanks for having me on. Brilliant, no, thanks very much for joining me. So I know that you've been involved with these standards a lot recently. So let's just kick off with ISO 14064 and share with our ISO show listeners what ISO 14064 actually is, what's it all about? So, BSEN ISO 14064 Part 1 2019, to give it its full name, is a specification with guidance at the organisational level for the quantification and reporting of greenhouse gas emissions and their removals. So, essentially in simple terms, 14064 is a standard for an organisation of any type, size, quantity or location globally to quantify its emissions of greenhouse gases with the end product of this being the creation of a greenhouse gas inventory. Okay, great. So that's literally any type of organisation, any size, anywhere uh, across the world then. So it's not just for large organisations, but it's for any type of organisation, whether they're in manufacturing, construction, or it could be a digital marketing agency, for example. So it is really applicable to all, isn't it? Exactly, yes. Okay, brilliant. So where do we begin with that then? Because with most other ISO standards that we talk about on this podcast, we talk about the scope. So is this any different? How do you go about doing that? So yeah, like you said, with most ISO standards, it does begin with defining a scope. In ISO 14064, the terminology is the organizational boundaries and the reporting boundaries. So essentially what you're covering in your greenhouse gas inventory and what the reporting boundaries are. So this will include any exclusions as well that you decide to make. Okay, great. So, so an organisation, if they're starting out on their sustainability roadmap, they could carve out part of the business, uh, so for example in the UK for year one, but then have a sustainability strategy, have a roadmap in place so that they include other locations and services as time goes on. Exactly, yes. Okay, great. And so you mentioned about the inventory. Could you just expand on that then, please? Yeah, so this is where you would document all your emission sources. 
So they are divided up into scope one, scope two, and scope three sources. Scope one being your more direct ones. So for example, stationary or mobile combustion. So that could be any gas or anything your organization directly burns, or that could even be mobile combustion. So that's referring to the vehicles you own. So then it goes into scope two, which is your purchased energy. So the electricity that you would use, say in the building that you own or lease. So that would be your purchased energy. And then going into scope three, it can get a bit more complicated, but this would be your other indirect sources upstream and downstream. Okay, so talking about the scope three emissions, because I think that's an area that people do get a bit confused about because they don't have direct control over it. And it's a little bit of a gray area. You mentioned about scope three emissions, both upstream and downstream. Could you just expand on that and give an example for say, a manufacturing organization that's manufacturing say computers yes so if you were a manufacturing company the upstream emissions would be the emissions associated with activities say before your product got to your manufacturing or your warehouse so that would include the for instance the extraction of the raw materials any processing for them any packaging and then the transport and distribution so the emissions associated with the say the vehicles so if you had to extract a raw material put it in a cargo ship and ship it across the world or even if it's in a transit van that drives three miles down the road that would be your upstream emissions so once then it would get to your warehouse or plant or factory after that point it would go off to the customer or other clients that's where you are looking at the downstream emissions so that can be again associated with mileage the use of the product and then any emissions that may result due to its uh, sort of end of life processing with you yeah okay great Th thanks for that explanation that's really helped to kind of clarify you know some examples for upstream and downstream scope three emissions yes and I'll, I'll just add another very useful thing about the greenhouse gas inventory is it does split it up for you so you don't have to worry about memorizing every single little part of the scopes because it is very useful in that aspect it literally lays it out on a list for you okay oh that's helpful and i guess once you've done that once and you've actually identified that it's then easier year on year to be able to review and update that is is that fair to say exactly yeah you can then use that to track any reductions you've made as a result of you know operational improvements okay great so it's a key thing here to then document all that information you know provide your justification and you know what's the next step i guess in terms of you know the choices that you've made you know in terms of explaining that what sort of things should we be considering on that? Uh, yes, so I'm sure we'll cover this later on in the podcast, but if you do decide to go for third party certification from a certification body, chances are they're going to ask you questions on why you decided to include and exclude certain things within your greenhouse gas inventory. So certain operations within your business or why have you excluded something which in your eyes might be a very, very small emission source but they may ask you why you've done that. Uh, another key element of producing a greenhouse gas inventory is you have to use emission factors. So I won't go into too much detail on these, but these are how you quantify and convert, say, kilowatts into tons of CO2 equivalent. So the certification body may ask you why you've chosen to use, for instance, a specific emissions factor for, say, a specific vehicle, which could be classed as medium or large. So it would always be a very good idea to document these choices as you may be asked on them okay that's great so so in essence that provides complete transparency doesn't it on your carbon emissions across the organization because you've justified the reason for including them or excluding them you've documented that you know you've provided clear explanations and i guess that's you know just going to be part of that sustainability strategy isn't it moving forward you need to kind of start somewhere <laughs> exactly yes you do need to start somewhere and the bottom line is you always need to avoid underestimating okay okay great thanks for uh, for those wise words uh, so just moving on to some of the benefits then because i think you know some organizations might think well what's the point in using a standard i can just kind of guess what our carbon footprint is we can get some energy bills and we can try and figure it out you know, what are the benefits of actually using ISO 14064? Yes, so because it's an ISO standard and internationally recognised one, it provides a reliable and proven framework for quantifying your emissions. 
So as a result of this, like you said, instead of just going through a few bills and making a rough guess, this really does help identify individual sources of emissions. So then obviously you'll be able to identify the biggest source of emissions and energy usage and vehicle usage, which then therefore you can use to identify areas for improvement by setting targets. Obviously the end result of going down this road is once you've implemented those improvements, it can actually save you costs in many instances, for instance, through lower energy usage. And I guess if an organisation is already certified to ISO 14001 or ISO 50001 for energy management, then this is a much more granular approach, isn't it? You dig it really kind of getting under the skin of your you know, carbon emissions based on how you use energy as an organisation. Yes, you are looking at very specific sources, yes. Mm, okay, great. So any other benefits then, David? Yes, so there is the benefit if it does help demonstrate your public commitment to environmental protection. This is obviously very good for your company image and your CSR. So again, combined with the third party verification, this really does help show you are committed to environmental protection and you're not just pursuing this activity for greenwashing purposes. So it is a genuine commitment. Yeah, I think that's the kind of the danger that, that a lot of uh, organisations are facing at the moment, isn't it? As you know, talking about greenwashing, businesses might just choose to go for offsetting, but they're not actually that clear on what the carbon footprint is before they even begin. So this can help to avoid all of that, can't it, by having that proof and, and verification of what your carbon footprint actually is before you actually go down the offsetting road. Exactly, yeah. The thing is, if you do go straight for offsetting, you may end up spending a lot, lot more money than you have to, for instance, in instead if you just implemented a carbon management plan. Yeah, because I, I know that uh, carbon management plans are now becoming a prerequisite for a lot of tenders. I know that in the UK, for example, if there's a, a public contract that's valued over £5 million from September this year, 2021, you need to have a carbon footprint management plan in place. So. Any other benefits of this standard from a tendering perspective? So yes, as well as it being a tendering requirement for a lot of new business, it can also support a lot of governmental requirements. So it can be a framework to help you support any mandatory reporting of emissions such as the SECR or ESOS. So these two requirements are essentially based around quantifying emissions and energy usage. So if you've implemented ISO 14064, You've basically already built that framework to help you with the data collection and data presentation that you'll need for the SCCR and ESOS reporting. Okay, great, yeah. So for those organisations that don't know what SECR or ESOS are, I know that ESOS is the Energy Saving Opportunity Scheme, which is managed, it's, it's regulated through the Environment Agency in the UK, but that is based on meeting an, an EU directive on energy reporting and identifying opportunities so this ties in perfectly with that and so obviously there's a legal requirement there but there is so also for SECR <laughs> that you mentioned David and it just explain how you know the carbon verification might support the SECR reporting which is another mandatory requirement isn't it? Yes yeah, so SECR streamlined energy and carbon reporting as it says in the name it is quite streamlined so there are fewer things and it doesn't go into quite as much detail, but irrespective of that, if you've completed ISO 14064 and verified your carbon, the work would have essentially almost already been done for SECR because you would have already quantified all your emissions and used the conversion factors to sort of convert things to kilowatt hours, for instance, and tons of CO2 equivalent, which is part of the reporting of SECR. Yeah. And one thing I noticed about this standard, which is very different to any other ISO standard that we have implemented over the last 15 years here at Blackmores, is the fact that you don't actually get certification to this standard, do you? It's, it's actually classed as verification. So could you just kind of share with me what the options are? Because I think it goes from self-verification, doesn't it, which some organisations are doing, through to third-party verification. Could you just kind of walk us through that then, please, and some of the benefits? Yeah, so like you said. Pros and cons, I guess. <laughs> yes, of course. So there's three main tiers to it. So you could do a self-verification where you essentially pour over the data yourself and decide internally within your company that, yes, we're happy with this and we're, you know, we're happy to publish this publicly. Although this is obviously slightly less credible because you have to take your organization's word for it, even though I'm sure they've probably worked very hard over it. 
The second level to that would be second party verification, where you get an external body such as Blackmore's to go over the data and essentially audit you on it. But what is generally regarded as the most credible is third party certification. So this would be done through a UCAS accredited certification body such as BSI or NQA. So like I said, this is generally accepted as the most credible and this really does help demonstrate credibility and demonstrate confidence to all your stakeholders that the verification has been done properly and you're not just making it up and you don't just have to take our word for it because an independent third party has looked over it and they've been very clear and they support the fact that we have met all the specifications of the standards. Okay, that's great. Yeah, so I think unlike the typical certification to say ISO 14001, it is very different in that it's verification, isn't it? Not certification. And also the fact that unlike certificates to management system standards like ISO 14001, where they're valid for three years, this is just valid for that period of time that you've actually defined within your scope as well. So that could be a period of 12 months that you're then going to have to go through re-verification process as well. Yes, yeah. Okay, cool. So I know that we've got a podcast coming up on carbonology, which is our very clear and simple process to meet the requirements of 14064 and past 2060 to be carbon neutral. But could you just kind of walk us through how carbonology might help with you know meeting the requirements of 14064? Yes, so carbonology, like you said, is our brand new service. This is based around a seven step process to help an organization become carbon neutral. Obviously, it'd be very difficult to become carbon neutral if you don't actually know what your carbon footprint is. <laughs> True. <laughs> so the first step of, yes. So the first step of carbonology is the quantify stage. So this is where ISO 14064 comes in, because this is where you would essentially quantify and document all your individual greenhouse gas emission sources for scope one, two, and three emissions. So yes, essentially ISO 14064 really does form the bedrock of the carbonology service because it's what you have to go on. Great. Okay. Lovely. Thanks very much then. Well, thanks for joining us today, David. I know you're going to be joining us again on the next podcast on Past 2060, but for now, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me, Mel. Great. Well, yeah, we'll be joining David on the next podcast when we'll be talking all about the next stage in your journey to becoming carbon neutral. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed listening to the podcast today, don't forget to leave a review. They're really handy for us. So if you go into your media player, it's really great because then we can then share that with more and more people and share the love on ISL standards. And also any feedback on any thing that you'd like to hear on the ISO show in the future. So thanks very much for listening and I look forward to catching up with you on the next ISO show. Looking to achieve certification to an ISO standard or just need a helping hand with ISO compliance? Contact us at blackmoresuk.com 